Okay, so, you know, as is tradition, we're gonna start the recording with me fumbling at, at screen sharing. So, um, here we go. I've trimmed that part off once <laughs> you get ready to go. But it's better to have more to trim off than not enough. Absolutely, all right. So I'm talking about six board chest, you know, the, the standard iconic Norse chest, which, you know, a place to put your stuff and then you put your butt on your stuff. They're, they're great, they're easy, and uh, let's get started. Um, so our first, we're gonna start with looking at, you know, sort of the extant ones. And the first one, of course, is the Mastermeyer chest because just so much has been written about it. It's, it really is sort of the iconic chest. Um, it was dug out of a swamp about a century ago. Um, there's not good dating on it besides Viking Age. Um, I, I looked, but I haven't found any uh, dendrochronological review like the the, um, the grain pattern, figure out when the, the tree was grown from that. And I don't believe there's been any carbon dating of it either. So Viking Age it is. Um, it's held together by nails. There's not fancy joinery. And in any of these, there's no real fancy joinery. Um, there is a mortise and tenon on the sides, which is a fancy term for there's a chunk of the board that sticks through and latches in that way. And those are on the narrow sides that we don't see in this picture. And then there's a rabbit joint, which is to say there's a little groove carved in the bottom of these big long sideboards that our bottom board fits in and then they are nailed on. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're not gonna talk about the locks or the hinges or anything, that just, just the, the chest itself. So going on to our next one, the Head of the Harbor chest. Um, and there's also the dimensions, but uh, the, the Mastermeyer chest, it's long and it's, it's fairly low. This guy is 20 inches long. Uh, nine inches wide, um, about ten and a half inches tall. And this is a fun one. It was dug out of the harbor um, uh, about half a meter under a shipwreck, so probably not connected to that shipwreck. But as its own thing, this guy was at some point, probably prior to 972, it was stolen. The lock plate was pried open whatever inside of it was taken out and somebody dumped a ballast rock um, in that it's a piece of granite and granite wasn't native to the region. So it was probably a chunk of ballast from some other ship. So this was sunk into the harbor to hide evidence um, and was dug up a thousand years later. Um, this is a little bit different than a lot of the other chests that we'll be looking at, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. It, uh, we're going to talk about our other really good extants from about this time er period, but a little bit before, and that of course is the Osberg burial chests. There are three mostly intact ones. Um, when they dug it up, there were evidence of three to four other chests, but they were in so many pieces, it there's not much written about them. There's, there's not much about them. So this is number 149. Um, and it's huge in that, you know, it's a little over a meter long. So 44 at the base, 42 at the top, it tapers up. Um, this is one of the wider ones we see too. It's uh, 12 and a half inches wide at the bottom and it tapers to about 11 and a half. And then it's 15 inches tall. Um, this one is again the rabbit joint holding the the bottom board on at the sides and a mortise and tenon that you know holds holds the sides and and the bottom together a little bit and all of these nails were tinned so when this was new it was shiny it it was a very fancy thing and Osberg 156 was broken up when the this burial was uh, pillaged and you know at some point before we did it um, but it's mostly the same size as 149 it's a little bit shorter a little bit wider um, 
this also has the steel band or iron banding all over the place. Um, any of these strips of metal are about six centimeters wide. Um, it would be pretty difficult to make thin strips larger than that with, with the metal working technology of the time. And yeah, this one is, is also nailed to high heaven, but in a much fancier way. This one also tinned also would have been tremendously fancy at the time. And then the third Osberg chest, uh, 178, it doesn't have the bling on it. Um, sorry, there's a cat back in there somewhere. Keep an eye, make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. Or, um, anyways, so this is a simpler chest. Um, it's, again, not as large as you think it is. It's 12 inches tall. Um, about a little over two feet long, but uh, th this really nice, good, clean lines. It's simple. Um, we get some good information about the lock on this one, but uh, the the unique thing about this one is if you look at a side side view of it, the mortise is about as wide as it is tall. So it's just this tiny little thing holding holding the bottom on and. Uh, Another interesting thing about this one is that you do actually see the center of, of the tree. So this was, the, this board was made to be as wide as possible instead of just rived, rived out from, you know, a quarter and then an eighth and then turned into a board. So it's a, an interesting thing about this board and it makes, you know, the pine that we can get at Home Depot a little bit more justifiable. So. And so those are basically the extants that we have. There are a number of chests found in Burka and Hedeby chamber graves, but none of them are very complete. You see some fancy hardware on, on hinges. Um, you see some more banding with lots of nails. Um, not enough to you know, say that everything was done like that, but enough to say that you know, this was a thing that was done. Um, now, an interesting thing that you'll see about these chests versus you know, your ugh, sort of iconic, you know, reenactor chest is that every reenactor chest has this half moon cut out of it, but none of these extants do. The closest you have is that head of the harbor one, but in that case, your half moon is cut out of this long side, not the short ends. Cass, there's a question in the chat about the banding. Yeah. If it was decorative or structural. Yes. <laughs> um, a little bit of both. I mean, that much banding is overkill. And uh, there, there's no real way around that unless there's a chance that somebody is going to go at the chest with an ax and that would make it take quite a bit longer to get into it. Um, it, it is definitely, it, it's sort of a power move that much banding. I mean, it adds a tremendous amount of weight to the chest. These are not going to be something that you take with you, not with all of that extra metal on and just be absurd. Which, power move the powerful people might have just because look I can afford three people to carry this um let's see let's go to stop share and let's see okay so the half moons are, are not something that you see very often I'm not sure where that came into it but it really does make them easier to pick up and it makes them easier to sort of level out on ground so I, I guess that's what we do, and that's that's okay. Um, the other thing is all of these are much smaller than you think. Every instruction I see for how to make your own six board chest starts with um, your your side leg pieces being sixteen to seventeen inches long because that's a comfortable seat. It's easier to sit on. You don't have to really crouch down and I mean, this is what we do, this is what's comfortable. If you wanna be really historically accurate, you can get used to, you know, almost almost squatting to, to get low down. 
Um, but, you know, this also suggests that really enormous boards, you didn't really have that option. So, you know, if, if anybody here is going to make their own out of Home Depot uh, 1 by 12, then that, you're, you're, you're reenacting a mildly luxurious thing. Um, but you know, that's okay. It's a little anachronistic, that that's okay. Um, the other thing that you see is decoration. Um, a lot of the ones you see on Pinterest have a whole lot of things carved on them. And I mean, that's a just fine expression of individuality. It makes it easier to spot your stuff. There's, you know, there, there are plenty of reasons to do it, but in the extants, you don't really see that. That Hedeby Harbor one, again, with that, that slight beating. Um, let's go back to that real quick. This guy right here, you can actually see some lines incised along the sides. And that's about the only carved decoration I was able to find in any chest before 1200. There are some caskets, which are, you know, reliquary size that have pretty elaborate carvings into, you know, your ivory plaques, but I don't see wood carving done very much. And again, if you want to, totally fine. There's just not a lot of evidence for it. Um, But let's see, let's, let's go into actual construction now. So this class is generally aimed for people who can borrow a circular saw and are kind of afraid of it. But if you have more woodworking knowledge than that, you can make your own, own chest, you don't need me. So I'm gonna go through the tools that you need to make, make one of these yourself. And I'll talk about different ways to do the floor because that mortise and tendon on a on an angled offset, it's not beginner work. So this is an angry demon that wants your fingers. I'm not just saying that because I'm in garb. That's how I introduce it in jeans. As long as you're a little afraid of a power tool, it will remind you to double check what you're doing and you know measure twice, cut once their words to live by. So yeah, you'll need that. You'll need an actual saw because we're not gonna do everything with the power tools. There's a lot of cleanup that's just gonna be a lot easier. Uh, you're gonna need a file and you can do it with just a big coarse file. I like this guy just so much. It's a wrap. Japanese style rasp file and it doesn't clog up. It's amazing, but there's no evidence of it in the Viking Age. So um, you can never have enough plants, but you're really only going to need two for this. Uh, you're going to need some way to mark a an angle that isn't 90 degrees. Um, I've got you know a fancy measuring marker guy but you don't need that. You can do all of this with a piece of cardboard that you guesstimated a 10 degree angle on. You can do it like that, that's totally fine. Um, now, I, I am actually gonna recommend some cut nails, or not wire cut nails, but actually forged nails. They are, rectangular on a cross section and let's see here they have you know some swell to them it's not just the the point of a regular nail and i'll talk about why these are pretty cool later in fact you might not be able to shut me up but we'll see um other stuff sandpaper um a knife to mark lines a pencil to mark lines all all of that stuff um now, as far as lumber goes, you can use oak. Oak is absolutely fantastic and I love it. I 
mean, this is my my good chest that's a full prism instead of just a rectangle and a trapezoid. But um, this was not my first attempt at a chest. Think of it as, you know, sewing your muslin. Because you're going to want to make all of your mistakes in pine before you do it in oak. It's very much a, a cost issue and also, you know, a disposability issue. If, if you're, you want something that can stand being outside and rained on, you don't want to worry about it very much, you might be looking at pine just so you're not putting as much money out in the rain. Um, let's see here. For the people who are taking this class to actually get some tips and tricks, we're not going to deal with the mortise and tenon of, of a center of, you know, a historic chest. But um, instead, I'm grabbing boards. Uh, what I have done is I've grabbed some quarter inch plywood that will be completely hidden and I don't have to, you know, really advertise my shame of plywood. But here I have a sideboard that already has a dado groove cut. And I did that with the circular saw. I'll show you how in a little bit that my bottom board uh, fits in real nice and it's the right size. Let's see if we can. All right, there we go. So you're going to need some wood for, you know, your sides. I ended up using about nine feet for this and then that piece of plywood, which annoyingly you can't go buy nine feet in, in a store. I had some scrap left over and two six foot boards. One of the six foot boards got turned into four leg pieces at 16 inches each. And you are going to want to cut these at an angle. Um, there we go. You can see that this is not a 90 degree angle. It's at a slant to support the fact that these side legs are going to be at this angle. And it's, you know, um, a parallelogram is what this board is. And if you can just put one board, in this case, that, that six footer, and you can just do parallelogram, 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 parallelogram. You don't have to worry about any extra scrap or loss or anything. Um, but uh, Besides those leg boards that I've already trimmed out, you are going to have, Oh, and this is potential chest number two. I have this one cut out but not trimmed to show off some other stuff like, um, you know, these are clearly not square, but uh, there we go. That's where they used to be. But, uh, your, your sides have to match. If you made a little bit of a mistake and they didn't perfectly match, you can clean them up with, with a tape with the, the circular saw. Just clamp them on top of each other. Like if one is just a little bit wider than the other, you could line them up, clamp them, and then just run that saw there, cutting them both out the same size. And then you pretend that's what you did the first time. Um, but once you have your sides, you're going to want, or your, your trapezoid sides, you're going to want to make them to fit onto your upright sides. And that's cutting out these notches here that are going to mate with.
with these knees. And this is like the world's most primitive dovetail. There's one single notch. But this is where a lot of the strength of this comes from. All of your weight on here is going to rest on that notch. And it's not terrible as far as, you know, modern joinery goes. But, um, so I'm going to set up a circular sock demo real quick to show you how to get those out at the right, right width. And change cameras. There we go. All right, so we've got this piece of board right here, and we want to cut off, you know, a chunk right there. Now we can't see that much very well, but it'll become more obvious. And what we want is for that to be the exact width of our board. So let's clamp it or get ready to clamp it. And circular saw, if you're a little bit nervous about it, that's fine, you can pull the battery and from there, it's not going to do anything to you. Now, and we can actually, you'll want to do it on this side. So right now we have the saw blade nestled right up next to the edge of the board and we want to cut off the thickness of this board. What we have here is a little scrap off cut from earlier. And we're gonna set that right next to it. And now we have a stir stick, which is just gonna be a straight edge right now. But uh, I'm gonna line that up and it will make sense why in a second. Now we're going to clamp our piece. And now we can remove this chunk of scrap right here. And now when we start sawing, we will remove a piece of material which is exactly this thickness which will be exactly what we need to nestle up and make that joint. Um, anybody have any questions about that? But really, that's, that's one of the little hacks to make this possible to a novice is, you know, cutting out exactly that right amount of material and then not having to sand forever. And yeah, the marine varnish is good stuff. It is, but um, you know, one way or the other, you're, when you put end grain directly on the ground, it's going to want to start wicking up unless you absolutely soak it through. But um, yeah, no, no questions about that. Um, so I don't think I'm actually going to saw that piece out because I don't even know what that sort of noise is going to do to the whole system. But um, if, if See, anybody has any, what's that? If you just mute yourself, we won't hear it. Oh, that's true. Um, let's see if th there's time for that at the end is I'll, I'll demonstrate doing a couple of those cuts and then doing all of the fitting. But uh, there might be some swears because carpentry fitting. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up all of the pieces parts that I did last night. And this doesn't really take all that long. When, once you have you know, your pattern and you've decided your sizes, um, I got it from board to ready to nail in about two hours last night. And that was with a lot of checking my phone for other stuff. So this isn't terribly complicated once you know what you're doing. All right, 
So here we have a stack of boards. Um, I'm gonna take out my top board because it's not being attached right now. Um, another thing I did last night was when I, I got all of the dry fitting done, I made sure to make notes. This is board number three, and it matches with the other board number three and is not guaranteed to match anything else. So three, three, and direction. help by knowing which side's the inside because there are little grooves in there which is a nice bit of help and stay and four to four there you are And there we go. My next step. Putting that board right there in that base. And let's see here, if I become concerned about it sagging a little bit on these side bottoms here, I have plenty of pieces of scrap. I can just cut a 10 degree angle on so that it actually fits flush. Um, and tuck them right in here and then just hidden screw them in. But, uh, and it would be a nice trick if I could come up with one more hand, but. There we go. Things are nice and snugged in now. And now, because this isn't at all 90 degrees, coming up with clamps is, is interesting. Um, I have done ratchet strap that works. It's a little bit silly, but it works and you know, can't ask for much more than that. Um, in fact, let me go grab that to demonstrate. Cass, I like your uh, little kitty supervisor in the back there. Oh yeah, uh, he, he is my shop supervisor. He yells when I don't have enough PPE or when he thinks I need a nap. So yeah, you can see a bit here is a ratchet strap over, you know, the whole length of it will get things held together long enough to get some nail holes pre-drilled. The very least be an extra pair of hands real quick. And I have to be a little careful of my sides, but I can almost. Oh man, I lost one side, but it stands up a little bit. You can see that it, it does in fact kind of work. Oh. Oh. 
the view from the showing the inside a little bit more than I could earlier. Let's, there we go. Yeah, you can see sort of how it looks and it works. And let's talk real quick about how I made that groove to sit the board in right there. Oh. Mm. Well, on a circular saw, if you, when you want to do those 10 degree cuts, you adjust right there. Right now it's at zero degrees, so it makes your, your 90 degrees, but you can loosen that and shift it to 10, which changes the guide and the, the blades angle to each other. Now, another thing you can do is there's this dial here. which changes how much available blade you have sticking out. You can change the depth of your cuts. And if you set it to, just a little, you can see that those teeth are on the other side of the guide, but just barely. You can, from there, If you want to freehand it, you're braver than I am. Or you can grab your straight edge. Which I somehow lost track of without going anywhere. It's a superpower. Anyways, we'll use another chunk of board. We would clamp down like this, just a little bit offset of where we want our groove, clamp it down, and then you don't have to really worry about, you know, is, is your blade wandering? You just look at this corner and this guide and just go. And then you'll have to, to make a groove big enough, you'd adjust that or adjust it, or maybe just do one side and then the other and chisel out your interior if you need it. I only had quarter inch um, plywood for the center groove. So I only needed two blade go throughs and th this tiny little amount in the center just took itself out. It was very satisfying. Um, but if you're going to do something like a whole three quarters inch board here, or also, if you're gonna do it more historically accurate, you're going to just start one groove and then you're gonna work your way all the way down here. Going from, this groove here is called a dado, D-A-D-O joint, and is really quite strong because you get a lot of, you know, grain on grain coverage and glue holds real nice that way. But um, we're gonna be doing it like the extants, we're gonna to have to remove all this material which, I mean, you can do that with multiple cuts with a um, circular saw, but honestly, I would just do like your end cut, maybe one in the middle, and then get a chisel, do a couple of stop cuts every now and then, so you only have to take out an inch or two at a time, and it, would, it will actually go pretty quickly. A little, little outside of the scope of this class, but if anyone's interested, yell at me, I am, happy to just keep talking. Um, so from here, we've got all of the parts to our chest. Um, I'll talk about how to fasten it. Now, oh, for this joint here, What we have, oh shoot, did not cut, show my finger. This joint here, what we have is, you know, glue is not gonna work super well for this. There's gonna be a lot of wood movement just as humidity happens. Um, we can glue, but we don't need to. What we are gonna do is a couple of nails. We're only gonna need
There we go. I think. There we go. Two nails here. And then we're going to put another two nails there and there. Now, and this sort of ties into my pet theory on why these trapezoidal ones survive better, but not right now, not like, uh, until they get nailed. So normal practice, putting a nail like this uh, straight down the end grain. parallel to the end grain like that, is an absolutely terrible idea. It's not going to stick. It's just going to get spat out very quickly, even with the, the superior holding capabilities of, of a forged square nail. So those ones are gonna fall apart really quick. However, at this, this 10 degree angle, you know, a nail that sort of goes in straight relative to this angle um, is not going to be directly into end grain as you can or yeah there, there's a little bit of an angle to it let's make sure yeah yeah you can you can see the grain lines at least i hope you can and then you can see how that nail crosses some of them and what that's going to do is going to add quite a bit more hold and you know my my pet theory is that's how why you see so many of these trapezoidal chests from this long ago really surviving is that you know they didn't fall apart in in the making and whether people really knew about the whole end grain thing or just knew that this worked let's do it that's you know six a dozen six of one half dozen of the other so um talking about our, our cut nails though, um, they do need pre-drilling. And honestly, I'm just gonna drive one or two into a piece of scrap wood to show what happens when you don't. So we got this guy right there. Um, let me grab a better platform I can nail into real quick. Excuse me, cat. I'm gonna mute myself real quick because it will quite likely be loud. But uh, with any luck, I will be able to report exactly why this is a bad idea. Okay, success, which is also failure. But you know, that's what I wanted to show. So if you don't pre-drill, and I mean, it may not happen if we hammered it in here, but for the purposes of this chest, we, we do need to nail in pretty close to the edge. So as you can see, we have a completely broken board. There is not much rescuing this. So I'm gonna pre-drill a hole really quick and try this again. We'll actually see if this is too small of a hole. So I guess we're doing science here. Bear with me. Now we got another hole, uh, crack. So 
clearly that was too small of a Oh, one second while I find a larger bit. And there we go. We have a proper, proper nail. All right, there we go. So, yeah, you you definitely need to pre pre drill, but you know, as we just saw, the right the right pre drill means you get you know the good nail hole or sticking right there next to the edge. Wrong size hole means you're very sad and you get a chunk of board that you can just sort of pop apart with very little effort. So that's because it's pine, but even oak will split if you don't pre-drill enough and then it's sad. All right, now that I have, so pardon the pun, nailed down the right size hole to drill, um, I'm gonna start putting this chest together real quick, although really quick, I'm gonna take off that uh, price tag on my plywood because I'm just sad. That doesn't need to be in any sort of evidence. And we'll just pretend it never happened and that this is a proper board, right? Yes. Sandpaper that would work. I have in the cabinet scraper that I just don't get to use enough. And then, besides all of this, is just a little curved piece of metal with a burr put on it. And it's fantastic. As long as it doesn't keep getting gummed up, it moves. All right, there we go. That's enough to count as not completely embarrassing. Okay. 
Fine. I was not really paid to be a perfectionist on pine because, again, this is sort of a muslin. And let's get that out of the way so we can sort of see my workspace. I am going to drill those two holes. I am going to sort of eyeball them. And then mark, I'm going to pull the pencil lead out of the mechanical pencil. I'm going to try to get my mark. Did not super take. Plan B is. Oh, going back to that itty bitty drill bit. That was almost embarrassing. <clears throat> All right, we have, yeah, might want to go up just another little notch because we've got a little bit of splitting, but that's all right. Will not be that much. But we now have two out of the six boards together, not falling apart. All 
up to 722nd in case anyone was curious. And, you know, exactly like the Vikings had in their workshops. <clears throat> Now, bring this one down here, which is not quite going into end grain because I will be growing that in at an angle. Got some funky green, but again, that's going to be all right. This will hold fairly well. So from here, I will be putting in two more nails to finish the hold, but I can line some glue in here, but I don't really need to. Oh, I may actually pull it out and sand just a little bit off of this one, but uh, that, that's the general bones of how a chest gets made. And uh, I'd like to open up this to questions, or it's actually three o'clock, so I guess that's uh, right about the right amount of time. That was a nice demonstration. You're, you're good. Where did you get the uh, strap, hinge straps? Oh, this guy? Oh, no, I'm sorry. On the chest that's already made, the metal oh, straps? Sorry. Um, I got those off of Etsy. There's a guy who does Mastermeyer chest um, reproduction hinges. Oh, cool. And I quite like them. They're the correct size, which means they're kind of tiny to a modern eye, but they do exactly what they need to do. That was a great presentation, Cass. So I will stop recording unless someone has some questions that we need to get on that recording. Uh, the forged square nails um, I got from Lee Valley Tools. Um, but yeah, you, you want the square shank and they're great nails. They have, they have hold, the way they work is very different than modern nails, which work themselves out over the course of a couple of decades pretty easily. These guys, the, like, even with the pre-drill, they, they crush their way in and it makes all of those wood fibers sort of act like a Chinese finger trap. The nail only gets tighter. Doesn't James Brothers or whatever that place is, oh, um, I have some, and I'm going to have to stop recording because my daughter just showed up and we have to do a car switch. So okay. I'm going to stop recording. Um, anyway.